Okay. So uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, what we're going to try and cover today is I'm going to give you some background and context to the tax accounting standards. Uh, as, as some of you may know, I was on the uh, Ministry of Finance committee, which was which kind of helped in formulating the tax accounting standards. So I'll share with you the approach that the committee has taken uh, on this. Uh, share some of the final recommendations. Uh, then talk about significant impact areas, and we've categorized them uh, for, for, for each kind of uh, area of the balance sheet in a way. So we talk about that. Uh, and then I'll summarize my thoughts at the end. Uh, as, as you are aware, the, the central government is empowered to notify accounting standards under Section 145.2 of the Income Tax Act. Uh, but historically, uh, uh, there have been there hasn't been too much activity in that area. Uh, only two accounting standards were notified: one, a generic one on accounting policies, and the other one on extraordinary items and events occurring after the balance sheet date. Uh, so, so effectively, there hasn't been too much, uh, too much done in that area, and because of that, there has been a lot of uncertainty and litigation uh, uh, in different areas relating to accounting and taxation. So, for example, uh, you know, many, many, many companies have followed the completed contract method for revenue recognition, uh, and 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 they've kind of said that look, if that's permissible for for accounting, that's equally permissible for tax purposes as well. Uh, and courts have held that, that, that look, if something is relevant for accounting, unless there is a specific provision in the Act, that is, that is perhaps acceptable for tax purposes as well. Uh, there have been various other areas of litigation. So, for example, you know, provision for claims. Uh, companies have rightly kind of uh, provided for these claims in accordance with the accounting standards. Uh, but the tax department has often kind of argued that, look, these are contingent uh, items. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, cannot be claimed, even though under the accounting standard, they are they are rightfully, you know, charged to the profit and loss account. So there have been various areas where, where such a litigation uh, kind of continues, uh, you know, in in many areas. The the other relevant point is the transition to the uh, IFRS converged standards in India or NDS. Uh, there was a lot of concern to say if you move to NDS in India, uh, what will happen to taxation? Uh, so NDS has many provisions which require uh, unrealized gains to be recognized on a mark-to-market basis and unrealized losses to be recognized as well. And there are many areas of notional kind of accounting. Uh, and the concern really was that, look, would, would, would companies have to bear the consequences of such notional accounting, uh, you, you know, from a tax perspective as well. A very simple example is mark-to-market on derivatives. Uh, uh, they will mark-to-market on derivatives both gains and losses would be recognized in profits as far as the as per the India standards, uh, and in the absence of any guidance, potentially these could also be subject to taxation on an unrealized basis. I.e., a company could be called upon to pay taxes on unrealized gains, which which which, which perhaps may not 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 be appropriate. Uh, with this background, the the CBDT constituted a committee. Uh, the terms of reference of the committee were to were to suggest accounting standards which will be notified. Uh, which could be notified, which are in harmony with the Act, uh, think through the MAT issues that will come up on transition to NDAS, uh, and, and, and also suggest any amendments that may be required to the Act for a smooth transition uh, to, to NDAS. Uh, the, the approach that the committee took uh, is to look at each individual accounting standard issued by the Institute. Uh, as you are aware, 31 accounting standards have been, have been issued by the Institute. Uh, and finally, the committee decided to, to, to issue uh, tax accounting standards on 14 areas uh, out of these 31 areas. Uh, the reason 14 and not all of 30, 31 is because some of the accounting standards, again, as we are aware, relate only to disclosures. So, for example, if you take earnings per share or you take segment disclosure, that's not quite relevant from a computation of tax perspective. Similarly, there are areas like amalgamations and mergers where there is specific guidance in the Act and therefore there is no need to issue a separate tax accounting standard. Uh, consolidation is another area which is not relevant because in India, taxes are paid, paid on a legal entity basis and not on the basis of consolidated financials or consolidated tax returns. Uh, lastly, there are some accounting standards which are, which are issued by the Institute uh, in the area of financial instruments which have not been notified and therefore they are not mandatorily applicable. 
uh, because of that, not many companies follow it. Some companies follow it, and and therefore it was felt that there, that this is not the appropriate time uh, to issue the tax accounting standards in this area. However, on this particular item on financial instrument, whatever is the issues that we saw in practice, especially in the area of derivatives and hedge accounting, those are areas which have been covered in 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 the, in the other tax accounting standard, even though a separate uh, tax accounting standard on financial instruments has not been issued. Uh, the committee also felt that there were there were other areas where where tax accounting standards should be issued, but you know cannot be issued right now because guidance from the institute is not in the form of accounting standard, but in the form of guidance notes. Uh, so one example is share based payment or stock options. Uh, as, as as again, some of you may be aware, there is a lot of litigation between companies and the department on whether stock option, a cost which is charged to the profit and loss account is a deductible item or not. Uh, 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 and, and there are many, many similar kind of instances around, you know, revenue recognition by real estate developers, uh, built operate transfer agreements, which are called service concession agreements, and in the oil and gas exploration side. Uh, the reason why the committee was constrained in, in issuing standards in this area is because the terms of reference were to take the existing accounting standards and issue equivalent tax accounting standards. So because the institute itself has not issued accounting standards in these four areas, uh, you know, tax accounting standards could not be issued. Having said that, uh, I think it is acknowledged that if we need to have a more comprehensive framework uh, in this area, uh, you will, we will need tax accounting standards on these kind of critical areas and similar uh, other areas as well. In terms of recommendations, uh, the, because the intention was to provide a basis for computation of income, uh, the tax accounting standards take the, uh, the, the institute standards as a base, but make amendments and modifications to make, it, you know, make, make them harmonious with the provisions of the Income Tax Act. Uh, and therefore, there are differences between the tax and the AS. But one thing I want to share with, the, with, the, with, uh, with this group is that the intention was to maintain the base as the Indian accounting standard. So we try to retain that as much as possible. Uh, again, because the intention is computation of income, uh, we've tried to give as much specific guidance as possible. And you'll see that in some of the changes which have been made to the accounting standards. Uh, again, it was felt that it, it's not fair that the same transaction is offered for tax in different ways by two companies uh, just based on different accounting treatment which is followed by them. And therefore, as far as possible, alternatives have been eliminated. Uh, a very good example of this is uh, revenue recognition, where a completed contract of a method of revenue recognition was permitted in certain circumstances earlier, but that has been eliminated by the tax accounting standard, uh, again with the view that as long as you have the same transaction, it should be offered for tax in a, in a similar manner. Uh, the one concern that we dealt with uh, while, while formulating the recommendation is that we do not expect companies uh, to maintain separate books of accounts. Uh, and there will be no separate financial statements prepared in accordance with the tax. But what is important, uh, uh, even just like we do it today, is to, is to maintain records which could, which could, uh, which could, re which would reconcile uh, the, the, the profits as per the books with the profits as per the uh, as per the tax accounting standards. So, so that, that that the records have to be maintained, but you don't need to maintain separate separate books uh, or separate financial statements. Uh, the tax apply to all taxpayers. Uh, while we have attempted to make sure that the tax are in conformity with the Act, it is possible that there could be future amendments to the Act which make the tax inconsistent with the Act. Uh, and while there is there is there, is, there will likely be a, a, a mechanism for making changes to the task in the future, uh, the 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 task specifically provide that where there is a conflict between the act and the task, the provisions of the act will prevail. Uh, we've also identified the need for transition provisions. So continuing with the same example I, I said on revenue recognition, uh, take the case of a company that has followed the completed contract method up to a point in time. Now let's assume for a minute that the tax become applicable from 1st of April 2013. Uh, at that point in time, the company could have several ongoing incomplete projects. Uh, because the company earlier followed the completed contract method, it would not have paid taxes on such incomplete projects and, and would pay taxes uh, only uh, when they are completed. Uh, but on the date when the tax is ad uh, adopted for the first time, which is 1st April 2013, 
uh, we need a provision which says what do you do with with profits till the date of uh, uh, of uh, you know on the opening date uh, because if you apply the percentage completion for the first time to such contracts some profits will come which should have been offered for tax in the past but but you know have not been offered and therefore need to be offered on some basis in the future so there will be many transitional issues in relation to transactions which are in progress and what we kind of recommended in the report is that there should be specific transitional provisions in each of these areas uh, which could be impacted uh, the the other the other recommendation that's been made by the committee is that the form 3pd should be amended to have a reconciliation between the profits as per the financial statements and the various adjustments required because of following the tax and this therefore would be subject to tax audit by the by the tax auditor uh we've also identified that certain things mentioned in the tax uh, cannot be cannot be uh, uh, operationalized without an amendment to the act itself and i'll take another example here uh, which is on leases so historically the the legal owner of an asset claims a depreciation on the asset uh, even though the asset may have been given on a finance lease uh, the tax changes that and now says that that going forward in the case of a finance lease the lessee will be treated as the owner and will get a depreciation because this provision is a fundamental provision which is inconsistent with the way depreciation is claimed under section 32 of the income tax act uh, we have said that look the act itself has to be identified uh, has, uh, has to be amended to to operationalize this this change in interest rate and there are a few other areas that have been identified as well uh lastly while the terms of our reference included the mat implications on transition to nas uh we finally decided not to not to uh, provide guidance on that issue right now uh, because of the uncertainty and inclarity of nas itself and the committee has noted that when you get closer to nas and there is some specific announcement by the regulator such as the ministry of corporate affairs that might be the right time to say that look is the manner in which mat is computed should be changed Uh, again for the benefit of the group the reason why this is important is that if indias is implemented a lot of unrealized gains and losses will come in the reported profits we said we will eliminate those as a part of the tax application so for the purpose of tax payments i mean that will be that problem will be dealt with through the issuance of the tax but but when you but when you uh, look at it from a mat perspective because mat is based on the profits computed as per the statutory accounts which will be indias uh, in the future Uh, the question really is that look is, is is that the appropriate way of 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 dealing with profits from a mat perspective so that's an issue which i guess will be dealt with uh, going forward but we've not we've not dealt with it in in the, in the current uh, final recommendations of the committee i would now you know like to touch upon some of the significant impact areas that that will that will uh, that will change because of tax the first area the first area i would like to touch upon is on accounting policy uh, as 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 you would be aware the, the concept of prudence is is uh, uh, is prevalent as far as accounting is concerned so for example if you have an onerous contract which you have entered into whether it is for a construction activity or or from a revenue perspective uh, it is acceptable to to make a provision for such onerous contract and in fact it is required under the framework that we follow for accounting what what the tax kind of determines is that because the purpose of taxation is not prudence but to but to kind of you know tax what is earned income uh, you know uh, such unrealized future losses should not be provided in the current period but only when they are uh, only when they are realized and and therefore the tax eliminates the concept of prudence and provides that unless there is a specific provision in an individual tax which requires unrealized losses to be provided for uh you know such such items cannot be provided in the in the financial statements one good example where where the concept of unrealized losses still continues is on inventory valuation so 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 inventory valuation the tax continues to provide that it is it has to be valued at cost or nrv whichever is lower and even though that's an unrealized loss in a manner of speaking because the tax explicitly provides for that that would continue but in other areas whether it is on uh, you know unrealized losses on on risk construction contracts or or other revenue contracts uh, uh, this would no longer be permitted uh, the tax also states that uh, you cannot change an accounting policy unless there is a reasonable cause now this is a slightly uh, tricky area uh, because reasonable cause could be very judgmental 
uh, and this could result in disputes between the between the tax authorities and companies, uh, and that's an area we should watch out for. Similarly, the TAS currently does not provide any guidance on how such changes in accounting policy should be dealt with. So, if there is an effect of that change in policy, uh, you know, how should that be treated for in the computation of income in the year in which the change is incorporated? Uh, I, I mean. Logically, any such change or the impact of the change should be adjusted in the current year profits, but that's not explicitly stated in the tax right now. On inventories, like I said, the basic principle remains the same, but a couple of areas I would like to highlight. Uh, one is, uh, 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 you know, on, when 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 uh, a SESI has a capital asset which it converts into stock in trade, uh, there is a gain which arises at that point in time. Uh, but the way the tax is worded right now, it is it is not clear. That such kind of revised value, which is a, which is the market value on the date of conversion, whether that would now become the cost of the inventory going forward. Now this is logical and in, and that should happen, but it's not explicit in the task uh, because the task is based on the cost principle and not on the principle of any fair value on the date of conversion. Uh, similarly, the task clarified uh, that that if you change the policy, uh, then the opening stock uh, at the beginning of the year should continue to be valued on the same basis that you followed for the last year's closing. And this again is intended to prevent any leakage in revenue uh, if the assessee says that look, you know, because I changed the uh, policy for closing stock, I changed the policy for my opening stock as well and therefore the difference between the opening stock of the current year for the new policy and the closing stock for the old policy gets lost from a taxation perspective. Uh, there were some disputes uh, in this area but that's now being effectively dealt with by a specific uh, an explicit provision uh, in the tax. Uh, uh, on events occurring after the end of the previous year, the tax says that if there is something which requires an adjustment, uh, and this this is what we normally call post balance sheets uh, adjusting events, uh, the, the tax says that look if something something requires an adjustment till the till the date of approval of the financial statement by the board or the approving authority, you can make that adjustment, which is the same thing that we do for the financial statements under the company tax. But it does not allow you to make any adjustments for events that may happen after the approval of the accounts by the approving authority and till the date the return of income is filed. Now this could be this could be a change because in many instances uh, you know companies do make changes for events that happen before the filing of the return of income but after the accounts have been approved by the by, by the board etc. Uh, and this could be done by filing revised financial statements for the purpose of tax returns etc. So again. Uh, an area that we should watch out for in terms of what the practical implications in, 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 in this area are. Uh, the tax clarifies and reiterates that prior period expense shall not be allowed as a deduction uh, and though it does not talk about prior period income, consistent with current practice, the assumption is that any prior period income would be subject to tax in the current year. Uh, construction contracts are a big area of change. Uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier, the completed contract method is no longer permitted. So I am aware of some companies uh, for certain types of contracts, they take a view that because the outcome of the contract is uncertain, uh, they will not follow the percentage completion method but recognize the profits and the margins only when the contract is completed. Uh, this is no longer permitted. Uh, similarly, another practice uh, uh, in the construction industry is for is for companies to, uh, uh, to 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 take a policy that because in the early stages of the contract it is uncertain on what my profit margins of the contract will be, I will defer recognition of margins till the contract has progressed to a certain minimum stage. Uh, this is permitted by the accounting standards. The TAS also permits. But, but one of the things that, that, that the committee noted that there was a lot of inconsistency in practice in how people define early stages of a contract. So while some companies would say up to 10% I will not recognize margin, some other companies were following a policy of saying 30% or 35% and even 50% in certain cases. So, so what the task finally recommends is that while you can continue with your policy of not recognizing margins in the early stages of a contract, the early stages of a contract cannot extend beyond 25%. So that's the outer limit in terms of, uh, of, of, of deferral. Uh, and, and, and beyond that, you do have to recognize the margins. We talked about expected losses on, on, on lost contracts and how such future contracts cannot be provided for. Uh, the other area is on incidental income. Uh, it is an accepted 
principle in the construction industry that incident to income, you know, due to deployment of funds or sale of surplus assets, etc., uh, is reduced from the construction from the total contract cost. Uh, the task now says this is not this is not acceptable. Cost and revenue should be treated separately, and therefore you cannot make such adjustment. Uh, uh, by analogy, what this means is that any such income which arises would need to be offered for tax on its own independent basis without linking it as an adjustment to the contract cost. Uh, the another area which which is which I think is a is a is a fairly uh, important area and where practice will evolve is on non-recognition of revenue due to uncertainty in collection. I'll give you an example. Let's say a company is, is doing a contract for a customer. Uh, the, the, the project is 60% complete, uh, but at some stage there is a problem on collections. Now for whatever commercial reasons, the company may continue the construction activity uh, and for accounting, it would, it would in those instances obviously stop recognizing the margin because if there's an uncertainty on collection, you know, they would not like to recognize the margin. The tax says that's not appropriate and the company should recognize revenues as if it is business as usual because it is still performing the activity and performing the work. And if there is a concern on collection, then that should be reflected to a bad debt expense kind of claim uh, which should be done in the parallel. The, the challenge with this is while this works well in the case of a sale of a goods when you have an invoice and therefore you can make a you know, bad debt claim against the invoice, it is unclear on how this would apply for construction contracts where you will end up recognizing a work in progress. You may not even have billed the customer. So it's not clear on how you will claim a bad debt expense in situations such, you know, such as these. This is an area which, like I said, where, where it will be interesting to, to see what the final task says and you know, how, how this is incorporated. Uh, lastly, uh, as far as real estate developers are concerned, as, as you may know, uh, there is a separate guidance note which, which deals with revenue recognition by real estate developers from an accounting perspective. Uh, no tax has been issued in that area, like I mentioned at the beginning of my of my of my presentation, uh, and therefore they will they will probably continue to be diversity of practice in this area. Having said that, I want to highlight that the if you look at both the tax on construction contracts, which we are talking about right now, and the tax on revenue recognition, which we'll talk about later. Both of them eliminate the concept of percentage completion, uh, of completed contract and require percentage completion. And therefore, in my mind, it is likely that the, that the tax authority will require all real estate developers to follow the percentage completion method, even though they may have you know, previously followed the completed contract method. The other problem for real estate developers, uh, which is relevant, is there is a the new guidance note, which the institute has come up with, puts several restrictions on, on revenue recognition even if you follow percentage completion. So for example, uh, you know, it says that you cannot recognize revenue unless a certain minimum number of units, 25% of the units in a particular project have been sold. Uh, uh, because the task does not have similar provisions as far as percentage completion is concerned, it is possible that the tax authorities may claim that the company should follow the tax on revenue recognition or the tax on construction contract even though for accounting purposes it may have decoded the revenue correctly following the guidance note which the institute has prescribed for real estate developers. So I think it's an important area. I know many of our clients have commented on this issue uh, when they have when they've given the feedback on the task, uh, but an area that, that you should watch out for. Continuing with the theme on basic revenue recognition, the same principle, uncertainty cannot be a basis for not recognizing revenue. You need to claim a bad debt expense. Completed contract not permitted. Expected losses, uh, uh, you know, cannot be provided. The the only incremental point I would like to highlight here is the accounting standard nine uh, on revenue recognition has a lot has, has illustrative guidance on certain items. So, for example, it says that if you end up collecting upfront fees in certain situations, you may have to defer those fees depending upon the terms of the agreement. Uh, now, the task does not carry that forward. One, one kind of way of looking at it would be to say, you know, the fundamentals don't change and therefore you could perhaps take the same approach for tax purposes. But another kind of argument would be that because the tax does not have these specific examples, maybe the intention is to, uh, to treat it differently for tax purposes when compared for the books. Uh, based, based on my interactions with the committee, uh, you know, my, my view is that uh, if there is no specific guidance in the TAS and there is an accounting guidance, then one could always rely on that as long as that is reasonable. And that's perhaps the way practice will evolve, but again, an area that we should watch out for. 
fixed assets, uh, the, 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 one, the first big difference uh, or actually what the task specified is that for in, in the case of exchange differences, uh, the, 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 the way you should account for exchange differences which are related to borrowing or purchases of fixed assets is in accordance with section 43A of the Act, right, which says that for an imported fixed asset, uh, you know, any exchange differences on, on the underlying loan or the payable should be adjusted against the actual cost of the asset. Uh, and that's the only adjustment to fixed asset. Now, this is good news in my mind for companies because even if, let's say, for accounting purposes, you are capitalizing other exchange differences, which are not on imported equipment. Let's say it is on, on, on uh, let's say there is a foreign currency loan, uh, and the foreign currency loan has been subsequently converted to rupees to buy an asset in India or, 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 build or do a project in India. And, and for accounting purposes, you are capitalizing the foreign exchange differences because that is permissible if, if that's the policy choice you've made under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, uh, notification. You could take a view that look for tax purposes because this is not 43A and because the, the accounting stand, the tax accounting standard on exchange differences allows me to charge it to profits, you know, I will claim it as a, as, a, as a deduction. I think there are some opportunities out there on exchange differences that we should watch out for. Uh, and the, the other thing which may not have a material impact but is a difference is that today when a fixed asset is acquired in a barter transaction in exchange for another asset, the accounting standards give a lot of flexibility to say, look, you know, you can determine this, uh, you can, you can record this asset acquired either based on the fair value of the asset you acquired, the fair value of the asset you've given, whichever is more reasonable or apparent. Uh, and the task says, no, it's got to be based on whichever is the lower of the two. So, so you know, we, again, that could have some impact. And lastly, the task prescribes that a fixed asset register should be, should be maintained uh, with specific disclosures. Uh, we foresee some practical challenges out here because, because uh, you know, as we know, for tax purposes, we follow the block concept for depreciation. Uh, and how this block concept then correlates to specific disclosures for individual assets in the fixed asset register is currently unclear. Again, I know many, many companies have commented on this as a part of the feedback process on the tax. Uh, for an exchange, uh, uh, I, 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 I talked about the point that all exchange differences will go to the profit and loss account unless they relate to uh, uh, unless they relate to fixed assets which are imported and therefore are covered by 43A. So big relief there. Uh, on the other hand, there's a, there, there's a little bit of uh, practical irritant because unlike the accounting standards which say that look, if you have a foreign currency transaction, you could translate that based on average rates for the month or for a week. Uh, the task does not allow that. Now, again, I, I, I'm not sure what practical benefit this gives to the tax authority, perhaps none, but from a, from a, from a practical perspective, this could be a problem for companies because if, they, if the ERP systems are designed to capture average rates, now suddenly you'll have to worry about daily rates with, like I said, no, no meaningful or material impact on anything. So, I, you know, I, I think this is not a good provision. Uh, the next one is very interesting. Uh, so, so take the case of a, of, a, of, of a bank, for example, and I'm just picking on a bank as an example, it could apply to anybody else, and, and a bank has a branch overseas. Uh, the, way, the way from an accounting perspective this is dealt with today is the bank determines whether the overseas branch is an integral branch where management and operations are controlled directly from India, or whether it is a non-integral branch, i.e. there is an independent management team independent sources of funding and, and the branch is, is in a way managed autonomously. If it is an integral branch, when the results of the branch are translated, all gains on the due to the translation, gains or losses are taken to the profit and loss account. While if it's a non-integral branch, all gains and losses are not taken to PNL but are taken to the reserves and, and, and are not again moved to the PNL until there's an actual repatriation of funds in the future. What the tax does is it says there's no difference from an income tax act perspective between integral and non-integral branches and therefore even for non-integral branches any gains or losses that arise should be taken to the profits of that particular year. Now this can be very material so, so for example for a, for a very large public sector bank uh, if you look at their last year's translation kind of uh, adjustment for non-integral operation it is around 1800 crore rupees right so it can be a very material uh, this thing and each individual company would need to look at this in terms of how it impacts them. Another small amendment relates to foreign currency option contracts. Uh, 
today the way the accounting standard is worded, it is not clear whether it applies to foreign currency option contracts as well or it is only for forward exchange contracts, the way we understand that. Right? And what, what, it, what the tax says is that look, you have a foreign currency option contract, which us, let's say, a debtor. So you have a debtor in the balance sheet and you have a foreign currency option to sell dollars. Uh, uh, just one second. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for that interruption. Uh, so, uh, so, so what, what the, uh, uh, so assume, assume, assume there is a debtor and, uh, and, and that debtor is translated at the, at the closing rate and, and the gain or loss is taken to the profits. Uh, what the tax says if you have an option against that debtor, let's say to sell dollars, and similarly any exchange difference on that option should also be recorded in the profits of the parent year to offset any profit or loss on the underlying data. This is, you know, based on the matching principle. I think it makes sense. And what it does is it, it, it takes away the, the kind of in-clarity in the accounting standard which was unclear on whether options should be treated the same way as forward contracts. More importantly, the TAS says that for all forward contracts or foreign exchange contracts, other than those relating to debtors and creditors or borrowing which exist on the balance sheet, all other, whether for trading purposes or whether for, for prospective forecasted transactions, should not be taken to the profit and loss account immediately, but should be recognized only at the time of settlement of the contract. This is a big, big change because there was a lot of litigation uh, and, 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 and dispute between companies and SSE. Many companies were taking mark-to-market -market losses on forward contracts as a deduction because that is what they were providing for under the, under the guidance of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, while the tax authorities had issued a circular internally to their officers saying that these were not to be allowed as a deduction. And there was a lot of dispute in this area. Uh, so the TAS gives a, a, a very specific kind of guidance on that to say that this, this, should be, this will be allowed as a deduction or will be taxable only at the time of the settlement of the, of the, of the uh, uh, derivative contract. Okay, uh, moving on to government grants, uh, the accounting standard currently says that if a grant is against a non-depreciable asset, for example land, or the grant is in the nature of a promoter contribution by the government, then a company can take this directly to the reserves as a capital reserve. Now what many companies had done is they had also carried forward this uh, uh, approach for tax purposes and therefore did not treat this as a, uh, you know, treated this as a capital kind of a contribution and, and this was never adjusted for, for tax purposes. Now what the TAS says is that if a grant is coming, it is for a for particular purpose. Either it is for the purpose of, of a particular asset, in which case you, re you record it as a reduction from the actual cost of the asset, from the block of the asset, or it is for, you know, operating in a particular backward area in which case you take it to income over the period for which you have to fulfill the conditions relating to the grant, or if it is for a non-depreciable asset such as land, you again take it to the income over a period, again, you know, related to the conditions which may be applicable for, the, for, for, for that particular grant. So the whole, the whole option of treating some grants as capital contributions goes away uh, with the TAS, or the TAS says that, that that's kind of uh, uh, not permissible. On securities, uh, uh, an important point is the tax only covers those securities which are held as stock in trade. Now this is because of the fact that for securities which are not stock in trade but are capital assets like what most companies would hold, they would be governed by the capital gains provisions of the Income Tax Act and because the tax only deal with computation of taxable income from business and profession or other sources, uh, the tax don't apply out there. But assume that, uh, that, that there is stock in trade. Uh, the, the, the TAS makes two, in my mind, two important kind of changes. One, today, there's a lot of inconsistency in practice on provision for diminution. So let's take, let's take a stockbroking entity which carries, uh, you know, stock in trade of security. Uh, many companies were taking a view that when they do the cost of market value, whichever is lower, they would do that at the individual security level. So let's say you had share A where the cost was 100 and the market value was 90, you would provide for that loss of 10, but if you had share B, where the cost was 100 and the market value was 110, you would not record any gain because it's cost or NRV, whichever is lower. 
the task now says that you've got to do this provisioning exercise on in, on the basis of categories and they've identified four categories. One is shares, second is debt security, third is convertible securities and fourth is any other securities. So in my example, if you take A and B together which are both shares, you will say that look the cost is 200 which is 100 plus 100. The, the, the market value is also 200 which is 90 plus 110 and therefore there is no diminution to be recorded as compared to the previous practice where 10 rupees of diminution would be recorded by the company. So this is a, this is a change that has been brought about and which may impact companies which have you know stock of security and follow a, uh, an individual security basis. And similarly to prevent misuse, the task says that you cannot make a provision for unlisted security because there is no way of determining the, the fair value. And similarly, if you have securities which are illiquid, which are which are traded infrequently on stock exchanges, then once again you probably don't have a basis of market it, marking it down. And in those instances, the loss will only be allowed at the time when they are when they are sold. So this again could be a change for for for, for some companies or some entities. Borrowing costs is another very big area uh, uh, where, where there where there have been a change. Uh, the first big change is that the task says that look, if you have a project where you are constructing a capital asset, you need to capitalize borrowing costs uh, irrespective of the period of time that the construction will take. Today, for accounting purposes, we take a period of 12 months and therefore let's say if you have an improvement project which is for 9 months, you would typically not capitalize any borrowing costs relating to that as far as the books of accounts are concerned or the financial statements are concerned. The task changes that. Now, arguably, this is this is nothing new, but this was always required under the provisions of the Income Tax Act because the Income Tax Act never had any provision relating to 12 months. Having said that, at a practical level, uh, you know, we have not seen too many companies making an adjustment to say that look, if I have not if I have not capitalized something for book purposes because the project was less than 12 months, I go and for tax purposes capitalize that as a borrowing cost. We haven't seen that in practice, so that that could come up for increased scrutiny uh, going forward. The related point also is the task set for inventories, uh, borrowing cost should be capitalized uh, if the inventory cycle is more than 12 months. So let's say if there's a real estate company uh, or you know which is which has in an inventory cycle of more than 12 months, then the task would require you to capitalize borrowing cost. Now while this may be in line with accounting standards, several companies have told me that for tax purposes they were claiming this as a deduction because their argument was that on inventory, which is not a capital asset, there was no requirement under the Income Tax Act to capitalize borrowing costs. So again, there, there could be various impacts for companies depending upon where they stand in terms of their current policies. The second uh, area worth highlighting is on exchange differences on, on, on loans. Now, under the accounting standards, uh, if you have a foreign currency loan, let's say you took the loan at 6%, uh, uh, and you have an exchange difference on that loan, what the accounting standards say is that to the extent there is a difference in interest rates between the foreign currency loan, which is say 6%, and a domestic loan, which is let's say 9% or 10%, that 3% or 4% of exchange differences should be treated as additional interest cost or borrowing cost, and that should also be considered when you're capitalizing borrowing costs. Again, because this provision does not exist in the Income Tax Act, the task says that look, all exchange differences should be charged to the PNL and should not be treated as a part of borrowing costs and therefore should not be considered for capitalization. So obviously, this is a benefit because all exchange differences now will go to profits and all losses will go to profits and will not need to be uh, part of the borrowing cost capitalization. The third thing on specific borrowing, the task brings in a very important change. Uh, the accounting standards say that if you if you have uh, if you have a specific borrowing and you have interest income on deployment of the of the uh, of the funds uh, you know from from that then that that is basically an adjustment to the interest cost. While what the task now says is that if you have a specific borrowing, all interest expense on that borrowing from day one, irrespective of the fact that you may have used only part of that borrowing on day one and may use it on an installment basis for deployment on the capital asset, the entire interest cost should be capitalized because it is relating to a specific borrowing. On the other hand, for the undeployed funds, if you are earning interest income, that should be treated like any other income and offered for taxes. So this is a, a big area of change again for many companies. Lastly, for uh, for uh, General, general borrowing, which are not kind of specific borrowing, the way we do this for accounting is we first find out 
what is our average borrowing cost in the balance sheet based on the weighted average borrowings in our balance sheet. We then say what is the average amount invested in the qualifying asset which is under construction and then we apply that borrowing rate uh, uh, you know, to, the, to the qualifying asset balance to find out how much of interest cost should be capitalized in the, in the, in the books of account. The TAS takes a completely different approach. What the TAS says is that look, you have a borrowing cost in your P&L or which you incurred. You need to take a portion of the borrowing cost and attribute it to the assets which are under construction. And the way you do it is you find out what is the average asset under construction. And that you do based on the average of the opening and the closing. Okay? And then you compare that average to the average total assets of the company. Let's say that, is, that gets you to an answer of 15%. If that is 15%, then 15% of the borrowing costs incurred have to be capitalized. So it's a, it's a very simplistic way of, of approaching the capitalization. Uh, the two concerns are one, it's very different to what you do for books. So you know how do you really manage this from a process perspective? And second is this could result in very very silly uh, things from a practical perspective. So let me take an example. Let's say you started constructing a project for April 3 of a year and you finish construction on 28th of March of the year. Like we said earlier, uh, the, 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 the task does not require minimum of 12 months. So ordinarily you would require to capitalize something on this particular project. But when you do, when you say, okay, so what is my average asset under construction in the beginning? Let's say this is the only project. You'll get to an answer of zero because at the beginning it was zero, at the end it was zero. And therefore you'll end up capitalizing nothing. Now I don't think this was the, this was the intention while formulating the task. Uh, but that's the way uh, you know it is dealing in practice right now. The last point on borrowing cost that I would like to highlight is on uh, what do you do in terms of capitalization of borrowing cost and there's an interruption in project activity. Let's say you have general borrowing, so you don't have a specific borrowing, but you're constructing a power plant and there's a lot of you know regulatory delays or, or, or delays in the project as a result of which there's an extended period for which you are not doing the construction activity. Under the accounting standard, you do not capitalize the borrowing cost in these periods because there has been a there has been an interruption. While the task says no, you've got to continue capitalizing because the amount is already locked up. Now again, think of it from this perspective. Because the accounting is, is written from the perspective of prudence, this makes sense because you don't want to load up the cost to the cost of the project. But what the tax guys are saying that prudence does not apply out here. Because you have funds invested and because you're incurring borrowing costs on that, you've got to rightfully capitalize interest on that. So I think that's really where uh, the distinction comes in. Leases is another big area of difference. I mentioned this briefly earlier that going forward, the, 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 the distinction between an operating lease and a finance lease is, is becoming relevant for tax purposes as well. Uh, so, so if there is a finance lease, then the lessee will treat the asset as their own asset and claim depreciation. If it's a manufacturer dealer lessor, so for example, let's say there is a software company or a product company which manufactures uh, uh, equipment and then also gives it on a finance lease to a, to, to a customer, they would treat it as a sale on a lease basis and recognize the margins at the time of the sale. And going forward, they would not claim depreciation on that even though they are the legal owner, but the depreciation will be claimed by the lessee. Uh, one of the other things because of this that, 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 that the uh, task brings in is to say that look the treatment of a lease by the lessor and the lessee has to be the same. So the definitions have been aligned and also there is a requirement of a joint confirmation. At the time of filing of the tax return there has to be a joint confirmation between the lessor and the lessee to say okay this is a finance lease or this is an operating lease and if it is a finance lease then, then the lessee will claim the depreciation and not the lesser. So that, that's, a, that's an important kind of a change and a requirement. Uh, one point I would like to highlight for the group is that while the, uh, while the basic things on lease have been clarified in the TAS, there are a lot of other provisions in the Income Tax Act. Let's say for example TBS. There are TBS provisions on leases, right? Now going forward in the case of a finance lease, uh, it will not be treated as, as if there is a, there is a, there is a you know, lease payment. But the, but, the, but the lessee, let's say, let's look at it from the lessee's perspective, every lease payment that the lessee makes will be broken up into a repayment of principal, which is, the, which is a kind of borrowing, and an interest cost, right? Now, as you know, the TBS provisions of interest are different from the TBS provisions on leases. So I think some of those consequential changes also would need to be incorporated, which is something that we have not, you know, the, the, the TAS does not deal with right now. The other thing that the TAS says is, it, for a finance lease, because the whole idea 
was to give very specific guidance, unlike the accounting standards which give indicators of when a, when a, when a lease is a finance lease, the task says if any of those conditions are met, you could get to a finance lease kind of classification. So that's the other change. And lastly, in the case of an operating lease, the accounting standard said that let's say if I'm a lessor and I've incurred some brokerage for, for, for leasing out a property to a, to, a, to a lessee, the accounting standard said that brokerage I can either charge off to the profit and loss account immediately or I could defer it over the life of the lease. Once again, it's based on you know giving alternatives and on the basis of prudence that look, you know, you should charge it off. But the but the task says that look, because this is a cost that you directly incur to obtaining the lease income, you got to defer it and recognize it over the period of the lease. So this could have an impact for for for, for less source. Uh, on intangible assets, the, the the one big area of focus is on uh, intangible assets which you capitalize internally. So what the accounting standard says is that look, if you are undertaking research which will be followed by development of an intangible, let's say a pharmaceutical molecule or a software software that you are kind of developing, you got to distinguish between the research phase and the development phase. All costs incurred in the research phase have to be charged to profits and all costs in the development phase have to be capitalized. Okay, the task does not change that, it's the same. But, but what the accounting standard also said is that if you cannot distinguish the research phase and the development phase, then you charge off everything to the profit and loss account. Once again, based on the concept of prudence, because you did not want company, you know, without demonstrating development to end up capitalizing kind of cost. Uh, the task says that's not fair. In all cases, you need to break up between research and development, and therefore you cannot avoid, you know, capitalizing the development cost, treating them as research. Lastly, the accounting standard uh, uh, also talks about commercial feasibility. To say that, look, if you are developing, again, to, to my example, let's say a software, and somewhere down the line you realize that, look, this may not be commercially feasible or you may not derive full benefits, then the, then the accounting standard says you stop capitalizing from there on, okay? Even though you may continue with the development activity because you see some benefit but not the full benefit. The task says that, look, that's not right. It's a capital cost. You continue to capitalize it. And remember, impairment is not a concept in taxes, right? So only in the future you will get depreciation on that or when you, you know, sell the software, you, you probably have a loss. But at this point in time, you cannot stop capitalizing. Capitalizing has to happen. And then in the, on the other hand, in the future, you could have a, a, a write down because of depreciation or because of loss at the time of sale. On provisions and contingencies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if a provision is correctly established in accordance with the principles, the task explicitly says this is a deductible item. So this will deal with a lot of uncertainty that are there in the past, where assessing officers used to say, look, warranty provision is not a deductible. Now, because the warranty provision is based in accordance with the accounting standard and the principles of the task which we talk about, it would be a deductible. So all those uncertainties go away. Similarly, let's say there's litigation and somebody has filed a case against you for a particular breach uh, and, and you have created a provision in line because you believe that you know it is uncertain and you you have a you know kind of a, a loss which is likely uh, and if that is in accordance with the principles of the tax that will be allowed as a deduction so you know that principle has been has been set to rest however uh, the tax makes two changes which you know uh, one could argue at least one change perhaps was not required the accounting standard says that you make a provision if the if the likelihood of the liability is probable, which normally is more likely than not, more than 50% chance. For some reason, the TAS uses the word reasonably certain. Okay, and like I said in the in the in the past when I was talking about accounting policy, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this reasonably certain argument uh, kind of plays out. The other thing that the TAS does, which is a very big fundamental change. Is consider that example I took where if somebody has filed a claim against you and you say, look, it is reasonably certain that I have a liability, you make a provision. The tax is saying no problem, you get a deduction. But the guy who has filed the claim also needs to make a similar assessment and say if it is reasonably certain that they will win, then they also need to offer this for tax in the at, at the same point in time. Now, this is a big difference from the accounting standard because on accounting standard based on prudence, Losses are recognized based on this concept of probable or reasonably certain, while gains are recognized only when they are virtually certain. So in, the, in that same example, for accounting purposes, let's say if it was a company, they would not recognize that gain because it can never be virtually certain. But for tax purposes, they may have to offer it for tax because it is reasonably certain that that claim will be won and that gain will accrue to them. 
Now, in practice, how this will be monitored by the tax authority and how will it be disclosed, I think will be a uh, will be a matter of of, of, of of interest and practice will will evolve in this area. So, in summary, uh, uh, like I said, the TAS now seeks to provide a uniform basis for computation of income. Uh, clarity on tax treatment. Uh, in a few cases, it modifies the current tax treatment as well. And eases is an example, and there are many other examples that we talked about. The TAS will remove the significant impediment to adoption of India because what it says is that look, it doesn't matter whether you are on Indian GAAP accounting or your NDAS accounting, your tax will be calculated for a framework which is the tax accounting standard framework. Uh, additional tax to be issued where there is no guidance to make this a more comprehensive framework. We talked about the fact that MAT clarification has still not been given, so that is something that would have to be dealt with prior to the implementation. And lastly and most importantly in my mind, the real benefit of tax will only be achieved uh, if the implementation is fair and uniform by the tax authority in the judiciary. What we don't want is a situation where, where basically if there is a position uh, which is favorable to the authority, that position is taken, while there is a provision which of the task which is more, you know, more, more kind of uh, favorable to the assessee that's ignored or vice versa. So I think it's important, some very important principles have been laid down, some very important concepts have been clarified, and I think the true benefit from a litigation and dispute perspective will only be if this is followed in letter and in spirit by, by both the department, assessee and the judiciary. With, with that, I will, uh, I, will, I will try and answer some, some questions. Uh, so I'm going to try and see. Uh, 